Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Hello, listeners. You're listening to Movie <laughs> Oubliette. Oh, I, can't, I can't sustain that. Um, the Hemisphere Encompassing <laughs> podcast with me, Dan, admiring the spring blossoms, signalling the upcoming summer here in Melbourne, Australia. And me, Conrad, discovering the joys of Uber Eats in Cambridge, UK. What? <laughs> <laughs> we live off Uber Eats over here. Uh, in this podcast, we ponder over genre films, horror, sci-fi and fantasy because we love cowering inside, stockpiling supplies and hiding from ravenous fire-breathing dragons. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it all sounded spookily familiar until that last one. Oh, yes. <laughs> How are you, Conrad? I'm, I'm pretty good, yeah. Still um, enjoying the fact that I'm not in lockdown at the moment. But mm. one of the things that I discovered during lockdown was the joy of ordering takeaway food. And I even downloaded Uber Eats as the app on my phone and... I'm addicted to it now. Every Saturday, I'm like ordering in food from a different place. It's really exciting. Wow, I am shocked. <laughs> I mean, we've we've been using Uber Eats for for years. Uh, it, it's it's always really? a, a Friday tradition. <laughs> yeah, takeaways on Friday. Um, but over here, we have like Uber Eats. We've got DoorDash. We've got Menu Log. We've got uh, oh, Wow Deliveroo. Yeah, I've got uh, that. Endless choice. <laughs> yeah, I've got that, but I usually go with Uber. They're really evil because every week, they just before like Saturday, they send me a thing saying, ooh, 10% off mm. or ooh, 25% yeah. off if you spend £30. It's like, mm. you're just tempting me. I know, I know, I know. Uh, but evil. it's great. <laughs> uh, it I good. did hear in New Zealand, though, because uh, we're in stage four lockdown at the moment because we've got more cases, uh, their stage four lockdown... They're not even allowed takeaways. Oh. So you can't even order in in stage four lockdown. That's in just Zealand. cruel. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I'm surprised there hasn't been a revolt. My yeah. goodness. Uh, I don't know how they survive. No, because they do contact free delivery here. You know, they just put it outside your yeah. door and tell you that it's there and then yeah. go away. So yeah, they do that here too. Yeah. And serve it up, wash your hands. It's fine. I don't wow. know. I don't know. <laughs> So, Conrad, have we been uh, hearing anything from our listeners? We have, yes. We have three new patrons as well. Oh. So, hello to David, Seth and James. Welcome aboard. It's really great to have you supporting the show. Oh, welcome aboard. Yes, yes. Um, and we heard from various people about what happens at the end of The Quiet Earth. Ah, yes. Good mystery. Scott Kesner said, parallel universe unearths itself. I'm not sure if it's, that's a pun or something. Oh, okay. I like it. Uh, Paul Anderson said, seen it many times and torn between it being another dimension or heaven, which could be the same thing. Oh. I never felt the rest of the world died, more that they moved on and these people were out of phase, left behind. A bit like the presence of Stephen King's The Langoliers, but without bad CGI Pac-Man. Mm, yeah. That miniseries is hard to watch now, isn't it? <laughs> it is. And it's a shame because the short story is so cool. I really love it. But yeah, yes. this yeah. miniseries does not hold up well. It does not date. Also, Paul Anderson said, has anyone else seen the similarity between Appy's costume and that worn by Robert Beltran in Night of the Comet? Oh, so, that's interesting. Yeah, it is, yeah. Maybe it's the uh, wardrobe of choice for a post-apocalyptic situation. <laughs> On Ghosts of Mars, that wicked person said, dying over Sandy not being able to navigate Wiston. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's like when not a Kiwi, Crocodile Dundee era Paul Hogan was being interviewed by Barbara Walters and after several tries she finally managed to figure out that he was saying that Hollywood was obsessed with age and weight, which sounded like obsessed with age and white. I don't know. <laughs> my, my grasp of Australian accents is not good. So. That's not bad though. <laughs> Something like that, but the wicked person spelt it out phonetically, which I thought was very helpful. Great. <laughs> we also heard from Lars Hendricks, previous guest. Hello, Lars. Oh, hey, Lars. And he said, outstanding episode. Bummer, the poor movie had to go into the oubliette. You still did make me curious enough to put it on my never-ending watch list. I am the one person who likes Mission to Mars just fine, so these trashy 2000s Mars movies seem to be made for me anyway. Mm, okay, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't mind revisiting these Mars movies. Mm. Maybe maybe they will be better. Yeah, maybe I suggest it to Melinda and Aaron as another crossover with Retro Blasting. <laughs> oh, yes. Move on from aquatic to Mars. To Mars, yeah. They can do Red Planet, we'll do Mission to Mars or something. I don't know. Great. Yeah. Eddie Coulter on Carpenter's filmography. I think The Ward is his worst one. I tried watching it twice and gave up both times. I agree with all your points on Ghosts of Mars, but I still enjoy watching it. I think one of the main problems with later Carpenter films is not having Dean Cundy involved as cinematographer. Mm, I think you've you've mentioned that to me. Yeah, it is interesting that a lot of the films that people love the most are from a period when Dean Cundy was his cinematographer and it sort of tails off sharply right. when Dean's off doing things like Jurassic Park. Mm. Uh -huh, yeah, right. I mean, you can't blame him really taking jobs from Spielberg. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, on what happens at the end of The Quiet Earth, we also heard from Serge of Cold Crash Pictures. Hello, Serge. Oh, wasn't he on that episode? <laughs> <laughs> he was, but he's got a new theory. Oh, yes. All of New Zealand was a dream. He's really just a resident of that planet with the geezers and the Saturn rise who fell asleep on the beach. But wait, the recorder's still in his hand. Maybe New Zealand was real after all. Oh, <laughs> that is a theory. It is, yes. Anyway, congratulations, Serge, on his relocation to Seattle. I hope it's mm. going well. Yes, congrats. New beginnings. Indeed. Uh, so that's everything from the mailbag, Dan. Uh, what do we have in our post box for the movie we're watching today? Oh, yes. Uh, it's my turn. It I is. haven't done this in a while. No. <laughs> Can okay. you remember the way? I think so. Down here, right? Ugh. Yeah. Oh, what is that smell? Oh. Some sort of giant dead animal. Oh. Oh, I think the movie's encased in an egg. Hang on. Uh, <laughs> Ooh, goopy. All right, I think I've got it. <laughs> oh. Oh, keep both eyes on the sky. Yeah, this stuff is hard to get off. <sighs> okay. So what have you got for us? Well, today we will be discussing the 2002 fantasy, pseudo sci-fi horror, um, action, US, UK, Irish co-production, oh, wow. Rain and Fire. Ooh. So this is directed by Rob Bowman of uh, X-Files. And a, a TV show that I completely forgot from my childhood called Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Oh. Uh, it's written by Greg Chabot uh, and Kevin Peter Peterka and Matt Greenberg. It stars Christian Bale Ooh. as Quinn, Matthew McConaughey as Van Zan, Isabella Skorupko as Alex Jensen, Gerard Butler as Creedy, Ooh. and others. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Those are the main ones. Ah, and uh, what's it about? So set in the future, in the fateful year of 2020, uh, ancient oh, wow. resurrected dragons have ravaged the earth, plunging humanity into hiding. A few survivors, including Quinn, played by Christian Bale, and Creedy, played by Gerard Butler, hold up in a very exposed castle in England, fearing <laughs> every second when they could be roasted alive. 
However, the unexpected appearance of a very exposed convoy of military armed Americans led by, <laughs> oh, right, oh, right, oh, right, yeah. Matthew McConaughey, <laughs> I mean, Van Zan, uh, shake up the already vulnerable safety of the Brits. But is the arrogant Van Zan the dragon slayer saviour he boasts to be, or are they all going to be barbecued to a crisp in their very exposed? Stone Castle oven. <laughs> <laughs> Stone baked, so to speak. Yes. <laughs> Wood fired. <laughs> or like dragon fired. <laughs> yep, sounds good. After the break. Tasty. And we are back to talk about Reign of Fire, Ooh. our second exploration into dragon cinema. Conrad, had you seen this movie? I haven't, no. Have you? No, I haven't. It's going to be a... <gasps> Double blind. <laughs> so this movie was chosen from one of our patrons, yeah. or suggested from one of our patrons, and then we put it to a vote. Yeah, so Matt Swafford from Reclaimers Vintage Toys, he proposed it. It was put up on the board with a bunch of fantasy movies and won by quite some margin. So mm. a lot of people want us to watch this dragon movie. And it's fun because we haven't actually looked at one since Dragon Slayer. Yeah, we haven't. What do you think? Well, I didn't know what to expect, really. On our patrons channel, somebody referred to it as himbos and dragons for the win when they saw that it came out on top. Yeah. That's kind of the impression that I had in my mind. I'd never paid it any attention because it's like Christian Bale, Gerard Butler and Matthew McConaughey battling dragons. And I just thought, this is going to be so toxically masculine. I don't think I can put up with it. But it surprised me, actually. It's a lot more interesting than that. Yeah, there are definitely more levels to it. If you watch the trailer, it is nothing like the trailer. Ah. The trailer is like balls to the wall action and explosion and heaps of heavy metal guitar. Right. It's not like that at all. They didn't go down the Resident Evil Underworld Matrix route. Right. Like it's not that cool factor. Like the score is anything but <laughs> electric guitar and heavy metal. But yeah, I did find the characters were a lot more complex than you would expect. But I did find it still a bit of a boys movie. Yeah. Because the female characters have nothing. No. Isabella Skorupko... There's like nothing for her to do. No. She's just there. And the secondary characters have pretty much nothing to do. I mean, you've got this bromance between Quinn and Creedy, that's Christian and Gerard. Mm -hmm. And I think Gerard Butler's character, Creedy, has like a significant other, but you sort of see her in the background in a cave and she never speaks. So, mm. and there are other women. I mean, obviously society would have completely crumbled otherwise, but they don't really feature at all. And all of the background characters, I mean, Alexander Siddig from Deep Space Nine is in this movie and he's just the radio guy. So he mm. basically turns into Uhura and all he gets to do is report that there's either no contacts on the radio or somebody's on the radio. That's <laughs> it. That's his entire role. Yeah. So it's pretty much focused on the three guys. You're right. And although Isabella Skorupko's character, Alex, is flying a helicopter, so she's pretty cool, pretty active, and she plays just as big a role in the finale as the two guys, mm. she doesn't really have a character. No, she isn't a character at no. all. Even plot wise, she doesn't really do a lot apart from fly a helicopter. Yeah. In the climactic scene, she's just kind of there. Bait at one point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I felt it was a lost opportunity. Yeah. And I'm not talking a lost opportunity in terms of like a love interest because they almost shoehorn that in there. But just anything, backstory, the interaction between her and Van Zen, what was that all about? Like, just nothing. <laughs> no. And yeah, like you said, with all the side characters, they're just kind of there. They're just like placeholders. They're just part of the background, part of the scenery. Mm. Like even Van Zan's crew, one minute they're there, the next they're not. <laughs> they're pretty disposable, to be honest. Yeah, aren't they? you just yeah. don't really feel anything. It's like, oh, I didn't even get to know that person and they're gone. Yeah, they're barbecued. <laughs> 
But what did you think of the general premise? I liked the premise. I thought it was really interesting. I mean, I've never seen a dragon-themed movie set in the future. Mm. I expected this to be set in medieval times. I thought it's a classic fantasy set in 1200 or something with knights and horseback. But it's set in the future, in an apocalypse of all things, with dragons. That's interesting. It is interesting, yeah. And I can't think of anything else like it. Yes, exactly. And I think it's reasonably... I don't know, it's not terribly believable, but, you know, it's a reasonable premise that they're digging the London Underground. I think it's the Jubilee line they're digging. Oh, uh, right. Yeah, accidentally unearth a dragon and set off a hole. I think it's affecting the whole world, isn't it? I think you see that in, like, a montage of newspaper clippings. Yeah, yeah. The whole world has been raised to the ground. Yeah, but you wake up one dragon and he just calls all his mates and then they just wake up. Is that what happened? Yeah, I don't know. (laughs) I guess so very peaceful down there and he was just enraged when he got woken up or did he just start just pumping out babies Uh, yeah that's one thing i did want a bit more of like more of what is going on here what is it's been 20 years or whatever since the dragons have been resurrected what happened like give us some history give us some lore into the dragons like what cities were destroyed you know i want some sort of progression of time. Yeah, I think people were disappointed because the poster famously depicts the city of London being besieged by loads of dragons burning the whole thing down. And you Mm. think, wow, this is going to be the apocalypse part of it. You know, it's going to be that story, but it's not. That happens while Christian Bale does his voiceover writing a letter to I think his adopted son. I'm not entirely sure Mm. who he's narrating to. But he narrates the whole backstory. So you don't actually get to see the uh, dragon apocalypse. You just get to see Brits wandering around in the ashes of the wasteland that came afterwards. I did kind of want almost like uh, similar to uh, Love and Monsters. So Mm. you have, you know, the ravaged landscape, but you see it. Like, I wanted them to be traveling and for it to almost be like a road movie, like an adventure movie where they go through the countryside and they come across Edinburgh and they come across, I don't know, another British city <laughs> that's very famous and iconic. Yeah. Even when they get to London, I think you see Big Ben. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. You don't really see any other iconic landmarks. You know, I want more of that. I want to see the devastation of the apocalypse. Yeah, you don't get to see With recognisable buildings. Yeah. (laughs) You know, like I Am Legend, you know, when he goes down Times Square, that... I want to see that. No, you just get castles and ash. I mean, the whole thing reminds me very much of 70s Doctor Who because they kept going to sort of either future Earth or future planets that have been devastated by nuclear war. Mm -hmm. And it was all filmed in a quarry in Wales. Right. And this is all filmed in a quarry in Ireland. Don't expect any colour here, folks. This is grey, grey, (laughs) grey on grey, people in grey clothes, wandering around in grey. Yeah. Yeah. I did wonder why all the children looked like they were straight from a, I don't know, 1920s orphanage as well. Like, why were they all wearing the same clothes? Like, it's the future. Why weren't they just wearing whatever they could find and being just mismatched? And Yeah, I don't understand how they've ended up in these sort of medieval clothes living in a castle. And I sense just a touch in your intro, Dan, of (laughs) scepticism over their choice of location for hiding from dragons. I mean, yeah, I can understand the castle. It looks good and it it is reinforcing the idea of, you know, dragons and castles and knights and that sort of thing. But it's not medieval times. It's the future. They should be living in bunkers underground. Like a castle is the most exposed building you could possibly (laughs) choose. And I can understand it's stone that's sort of fireproof you know it's not going to burn but they should be underground i mean they might as well just stick a sign up with neon lights saying dragons come here please (laughs) (laughs) i mean they've got spotlights on most of the time as well what is going on in fairness i think they are living underground under the castle and they're just using the castle as a fortification and they have their whole sprinkler system set up with the plumbing to protect them it's sort of like helm's deep you know when the dragons attack they go underground turn the sprinklers on and wait for it all to 
be over. Okay. So yeah. But still, it is interesting that given the premise of putting dragons in modern day or 2020, that disastrous year of 2020, can you <laughs> yes. imagine how amazing the uh, prescient that was? Ooh, it yeah. still has to be A, England, and B, castles, and everybody's wearing Hessian. I. It's sort of disappointing. They're sort of copping out on their premise almost by doing that. Mm, yeah, I mean, surely some technology or modern part of life would have survived mm. beyond the apocalypse. Yeah, I mean, they're using horses and rifles and Morse code. Yeah, I don't know. I get it. Like it's sort of going back and to the simple technology, and they just seem very ill prepared as well when the dragons would show up. Yeah. I don't know. It just seemed like they were just waiting to be charred. (laughs) At the heart of it, there are two stories going on. There's the main character, Quinn, who, as a child, saw the dragon apocalypse start right at ground zero, literally. Mm. Could just wander into a construction site. I know. A child. A child (laughs) with no hard hat on, (laughs) laughing and joking with the workmen about smoking and going to see his mother. And apparently that's okay. I'm afraid not. We have health and safety laws in the UK. There is no way on God's earth that would ever happen. Fine. But you've got him. He's scarred. He wants to take like a cautious approach. He's looking after this community. He's kind of a de facto leader. He's not a natural leader. He doesn't want to be a leader. When Van Zandt turns up and says, I want to speak to the guy in charge, Creedy says, I guess that's you then. And Quinn's like, Mm. you know, he's a reluctant leader and he just wants to try and keep everyone safe. So they're Mm. growing crops, they're hiding, they're teaching their kids If you see a dragon, run and hide, roll in a puddle. You know, it's all about (laughs) hiding and waiting for the dragons to starve, I guess. Whereas Van Zan is the American. He's got his tanks. He's showing up and he's saying, let's kill them all. And to begin with, I thought, oh, no, this is a World War II parable. And here's the Brits cowering under this firebombing from the sky on dwindling rations, Mm. waiting for the Americans to turn up and save us. Talking like that. Yeah, I know. Why the Cockney accent, though? Yeah, I hate it when Christian Bale does a Cockney accent. I mean, at least Gerard got to do his native Scottish accent, but... Yeah. Cockney? Christian Bale is not a <laughs> Londoner. He went to my school, right. Edgeborough School in Crowthorne, right. Berkshire. That is not his accent. I've heard him do it in interviews. I don't know why he's this London geezer. <laughs> yeah, no, he's not Vinnie Jones. Yeah. I was surprised uh, to see Matthew McConaughey's role in this is quite interesting. Yeah. Because I was looking at his filmography of the time. Yeah. And he went from Ed TV in 99 to U571 2000, The Wedding Planner 2001, mm. Frailty, which is a pretty decent thriller 2001, and then this, and then the following year, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. That's pretty impressive. He goes from all of these, most of them rom-coms, into this, and he looks ripped. Oh, yeah. I don't think I've ever seen him so bulked up. He looks like he is the only American that could play this role. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, he was ripped even in those rom-coms, though, because he was quite an idealised man. I mean, he was usually shirtless at some point, you know, wiping down a boat or something. I don't know. (laughs) But, yeah, he was going through this whole phase of being in rom-coms where the poster would have him leaning up against another woman. Yes. They're all pretty much the same. He was in Failure to Launch a few years later. Yes. And I think he said recently, because, of course, he vanished and then there was what they call him a connaissance. Mm. He came back with things like Interstellar. And I think he's talked about deliberately turning down rom-coms, being offered ridiculous amounts of money to be in them and just turning them down, trying to get different types of role. Right. And I guess this is one of them. I mean, this 
cast him as something completely different. I actually really like him in this role. I do as well. Like, I mean, he really exudes the arrogant, cocky, yeah. asshole American <laughs> military guy. He really, really fits into that role perfectly. And he's just sort of juxtaposed with um, Christian Bale's, like, cockney Brit. Yeah. It's kind of a good dynamic. I liked it. Yeah, I liked it. And it's not so much about America versus the Brits necessarily. It's about conviction. So... Christian Bale has seen the damage the dragons can do, and he's traumatized as a child and he's afraid. Mm, He's trying to keep everyone safe. So he's taking a cautious approach. He tells Van Zandt, if you do a full frontal attack on these things, they're going to track you back to here and they're going to kill all of us. And it turns out that he's right. Mm, And Van Zandt's arc is that he learns that, you know, you can't just go out all guns blazing. It's not going to work. Mm. And Quinn's character, by reverse, learns that they do have to do something proactive. And it's the two of them combining their knowledge and their skills that leads them towards a solution that helps everybody. Mm, Because magically killing one dragon will wipe out the whole race. Yeah. Because there's only one male dragon. We can get to that in the movie because, yes, it's one of those things that is just very convenient. (laughs) The one weakness of dragons that I don't know whether was really utilised that much was the fact that dragons couldn't really see... In the golden hour, so yeah. at dusk. It's quite a cinematic weakness to have, isn't it? That you can only be killed during magic hour. <laughs> Terence Malick would love it. Oh, yeah. Every filmmaker's dream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they do attack the dragon at that time, and it seems pretty unfazed by that time of the day. Yeah, you get to see a few POV shots from the dragon. Yeah, dragon predator vision. Yeah. And I think there's one moment where Christian Bale sort of disappears sort because of. he's n- not moving behind some rubble, but it's not like that leads to the dragon's death at all. It's just good yeah. timing and balls really. There were no moments where the dragon looked confused. No. Like he seemed to know exactly where all the humans were yeah. at any time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I don't know. I, I feel like they almost forgot about that mm. or something. Yeah, so I didn't like that so much. I did like that Van Zandt's character, I mean, Christian Bale's character is a you know wounded character who has to learn courage to lead his people. Mm. That's great. Van Zandt's character had to learn some humility and collaborate a little bit more. Because, I mean, he gets to the point where he's drafting people, quote-unquote, at gunpoint. Mm. So that's just fascism. That's not the answer. And so I like that you have this whole thing where, you know, he says to Quinn at the beginning, I lead, you follow. Yes. And then later on it's, you lead, we follow. Yeah. And you have that whole thing where after he's killed one dragon, you have the scene where everybody's having a party to Jimi Hendrix. And uh, he comes in and says... There is nothing to celebrate here. Three Mm. of my men are dead. It's one dragon. Mm. This is stupid. And I think you're all disgusting. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Just little details like the fact that he has a hip flask all the way through that he's necking. Yeah. And it turns out that that's water when when he offers it to Quinn. It's just water. I thought, do you know, actually, this guy is quite interesting. Yeah, he is. As a character. He really is. Like, he isn't face value what he appears to be. Mm. Yeah, he reaches a point where he learns, like, like, my approach is not working. Yeah. I'm going to let someone else sort of lead the way. I like that. Mm. Just quickly, Jared Butler, I- I've never seen him so skinny. He looks just very weasley. He does, yeah. And it's surprising. <laughs> it is. They do have quite a nice bromance, those two. Yeah. Creedy and Quinn. I liked it. I like their community theatre reproductions of The Empire Strikes Back for Oh, the yes, kids. yes. <laughs> the white knight versus the black knight. <laughs> yeah, don't want to get sued by George Lucas. Yeah, no, I quite liked that. And the fact that, um, you know, spoilers, Creedy gets killed at the end of Act 2. And mm. he gets this one moment where he gets to look lovingly back at Quinn before he gets roasted. Mm. But again, he's not really in it enough I to know. make much of an impact. I wasn't really all that sad. Yeah. I mean, when you really break down the key moments of the film, there are only maybe four or five dragon occurrences and they're, they're all fairly short. Yeah. So the rest of it is a lot of dialogue. 
but they kind of, it's almost like they don't make the most of the dialogue. It's strange. It is strange. There's one area of it that I think is really sad, which is that Quinn has this adopted son who just sort of grins a lot and doesn't get many lines. And Mm. it's a shame because they've got this whole thing about Quinn wanting him to be the leader one day and preparing him for it. Yeah. And not wanting him to volunteer to go on Van Zandt's mission to kill dragons. And it has this whole air of the boomer generation struggling to let their children go to war. Mm. This crops up in War of the Worlds as well, which is from about the same era, Spielberg's War of the Worlds, which shares a lot of similarities with this. And in that one, he does let him go. Tom Cruise lets his kid go to war and he improbably survives it all. Mm. (laughs) Whereas in this one, the kid thinks better of it and comes back again. But again, it's an opportunity for a lot of pathos and a lot of emotional engagement Mm. that I have to admit I didn't really get. Yeah, Because, I mean, the kid never spoke apart from that, so I never really got a strong sense of what they meant to each other or who he even was. Yeah, exactly. This is a dragon movie. Let's talk about the dragon. (laughs) Let's talk about, yeah, dragon special effects. So the director, Rob Bowman, said in an interview at the time, let's not do this if we don't make a new benchmark for dragons. Mm. So that was his goal. And Vermithrak's pejorative from 1981's Dragon Slayer, which we talked about in a previous episode, Mm -hmm. loomed large in the production. So the art director, Mike Tevez, said, we're trying to do a modern take on Vermithrax, which is one of the best dragons of all time. And I have to say, I think they nailed it. I would say this is the first really impressive concept design for a dragon yeah so previously dragon heart came out in 1996 yeah and the dragon design i mean i guess it's supposed to be a nice dragon yeah so it's not supposed to be ferocious and terrifying but it looks cartoony yeah it does it's pete's dragon isn't it yeah this one looks like on the way to game of thrones type dragon yeah in terms of just being terrifying It is truly terrifying in this movie. And it's quite shocking how good the CGI is. Mm. 2002, and it's not a huge, huge budget movie, but wow. They got the size, they got the dread, they got the colors and compositing. I mean, the last scene is like broad daylight. There's nowhere to hide this dragon. No. They could have done it at night and just had like glimpses of scales or wings and stuff like that. It probably would have been very hard to make out what was actually going on, but they did it broad daylight, which was like, wow, yeah, that's balls uh, with 2002 CGI, but they pulled it off. They did pull it off. The Secret Lab, Disney's own special effects company in-house, which was disbanded shortly after this film was completed. Oh, wow. They did 130 shots of dragons, and they had to try and figure out a scale system, which they based on the hair renderer that they developed for 102 Dalmatians, so that the scales are individual things that slide over each other Mm. and move realistically, rather than just a flat texture that's painted on the shape. And they sort of move like rubber, which is what they had on Dragonheart. And that's why that looks like a piece of plastic. Right. Okay. (laughs) Lots of things invented for this. And it looks great. Mm. It looks really great. And watching all the behind the scenes where all the actors were just filmed on location, reacting to literally nothing. Yeah. Maybe some flames here and there, but literally nothing. It worked. I am shocked. I am shocked how well it worked. Yeah, it is really good. I mean, the first time you see the dragon, I was completely sold on it. There's just shots of it flying and you sort of glimpse it between the vines that they're growing tomatoes on. Yes. And it's beautifully rotoscoped, beautifully animated, Mm. beautifully colour timed so that it really does look like it's there. Yeah. And you think, okay, I can see this set up Game of Thrones. Yes. This really did set a benchmark for the way forward with dragons. The way it looks, the mechanics of how it creates fire, where it's combining two different chemicals, which was based on the bombardier beetle, apparently. Oh, right. Which fires two chemicals out of its backside, actually, as a defense (laughs) reaction. And that's repeated in 
Game of Thrones and also in Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire a couple of years later. Right, right. So this film is very influential in dragon lore, I would say. I can see a lot of other things that followed afterwards benefiting from all of the work they did here in terms of Mm. how it looks, how it moves, and trying to believably get it to fly as well, considering its size. The movements. Great. So accurate. And I did hear that they based it on a lot of different animals. Mm. So they wanted it to move on the ground like a leopard, but to sound like a cobra and skin like an alligator and the spine of like a serpent. Yeah. So a lot of different animals influence the look and also the sound of the dragon. Yeah. And I think another thing that they did really well on, because this is early 2000s, so this is CGI is not great at natural phenomenon. So to actually film real fire, to have two fire hoses, yeah. just spraying napalm <laughs> and then putting the dragon where the tractor is that was firing the fire. I think a lot of it is practical. I think some of it is CGI and some, and that's where it looks a little bit dodgy, but most of it's real. And I think the film benefits enormously from that. Mm. Yeah, I didn't realize how much of the fire was real. Like they used a lot of propane, yeah. liquid propane on That's this. Not what it is. They yeah. used eight tons of liquid propane oh, God. and several thousand gallons of diesel for the smoke effects. But the flames look great. And if you watch the behind the scenes, some of those fire bursts are huge. Yeah. And they just had to, you know, edit out the bulldozers and the propane canisters and stuff and insert dragon. But the combination of practical and CGI really sells it Mm. and it makes it much more believable. I think also with fire as well, getting all the lighting right, it just works. Yeah, it really does. And they have um, not much of a character. They're not anthropomorphized, but the big bad dragon at the end that they have Mm. to defeat. I mean, he is really menacing. Yeah. Um, I kind of did want more character traits for the dragons to make them more of a villain because they were just a okay. big scary creature. I, I wanted more sort of what are their motives here? Are they just trying to kill off humanity or are they just using humans as food? Yeah, I think they said that they like eating ash. They liked eating ash? Yeah, that's a weird diet, isn't it? Yeah, they like burning <laughs> things and then they eat the ash. I'm not sure what the calorific value of ashes <laughs> not a lot i wouldn't have thought a lot of carbon i would imagine <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was their thing they liked eating ash right okay but i mean he didn't seem to mind munching down on matthew mcconaughey when he got a chance so yeah yeah i did quite like the fact that matthew mcconaughey's character um van Zan, he wasn't the savior at the end no i think that would have killed the movie if he jumped in and axe wielding and you know (laughs) chopped off the dragon's head or something that would have been awful but at the same time i was a little disappointed with how quinn does defeat the dragon at the end with the rambo bow and arrow (laughs) explosive i don't know was that a reference like uh, i don't know if it's a reference to anything it's jaws i mean the third act of the movie pretty much is jaws You know, the grizzled hunter of the monster gets eaten, Mm -hmm. having failed to kill it. And the everyman who's scared fires something into the mouth of the monster at exactly the right time. And then it blows up. I mean, it's Jaws, basically. Yeah, right, right. I wish they hadn't stated the bow and arrow sort of approach to killing the monster. And he just figured it out. Yeah. Because when he did it, it's like, we know how it works already. Like, I wish there was more sort of left up to Quinn to work out and sort of show his resourcefulness, but he just had to find it because he dropped it. (laughs) Yeah, and Alex spotted it. So that was her contribution. Yeah, okay. She spotted the arrow. That's that's good. It's handy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Now it's time for Random Trivia. So, Dan, what fascinating piece of trivia have you unearthed from the ashes of a smouldering London today? (laughs) So, Gerard Butler, did you know he was also the voice of a character called Stoic in How to Train Your Dragon, the animated film from 2010. So, not his only foray into the dragon genre. No, I'd forgotten about that because he's the father figure in that movie have you seen that one i can't remember 
one of the villagers, maybe, or maybe it was the father. He was the father. Yeah,、oh, I love、okay. that movie. It is good. I absolutely love it. It is good. The、yeah. sequels. Uh, they're okay. They're not as good as the yeah, first one.、No. But yeah, the first one really nailed it.、Uh, second bit of trivia, just quickly: both Gerard Butler and Isabella Skrupko have been in James Bond movies. Oh, so Skrupko was in Goldeneye in 1995 as the character Natalia so- Simonova, and、uh, Gerard Butler was in Tomorrow Never Dies in 1997 as leading seaman. <laughs> Obviously, an extra, and only his second ever film role. So, wow, yeah, <laughs> that makes me want to watch that movie to see if I can spot him. Oh, it'll probably it's be not easy. Blinking, and you'll miss him. Yeah,、uh, probably. I didn't realize that Gerard Butler. He wasn't even his his career path wasn't to be an actor. He initially st- was studying law. Oh, of all things. Uh, and he、nice. got approached or something by by someone that said, "Oh, you should do acting," and then and then he did. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's weird because usually that sort of happens to incredibly attractive people. You know, they just sort of say, "Oh, you know, you've got a face for movies. Have you ever tried that kind of thing?" Whereas Gerard Butler's not really an oil painting. He's Yeah, you know he's a nice guy, but he's not really drop dead gorgeous or anything. Oh, I don't know. Have you seen Three <laughs> Hundred? I mean, it's it's all、um, the ab- about the abs, isn't it? <laughs> well, I was going to say it's not his face really in that, <laughs> is it? <laughs> yeah, and that's our trivia. All right. I did find this movie like you did mention. It was almost like a war parable.、Mm. It did feel like that. I felt like I was watching more of an action thriller than an actual fantasy. Yes, I think purely because they didn't go into the dragon lore and you know their traits as beasts, and it was much more about like we have to go here and kill this thing and blow this up, and there was all the military tactics. It felt much more like a I don't know like a Mission Impossible movie or something. Yeah, it is very much an action movie, and it feels I compared it a lot to War of the Worlds because it feels like a clutch of movies immediately after nine eleven in two thousand and one. Right, had people wandering around in ash. Fighting some terrible monster,、mm-hmm. and when I was preparing for the Iconicon interview with Mike Matesano, I listened to an interview that he did about War of the Worlds because he produced that CD、right. for La La Land, and he pointed out that in War of the Worlds, the aliens don't come from space; they come from the ground. Uh-huh. And yet again, here the dragons come from under the ground.、Right. He was talking about how post nine eleven, a lot of these fantasy apocalyptic disaster movies posited the problem as coming from our nation's foundations, so to speak.、Right. That our enemies are buried in the foundation of our country, waiting to come up and bite us at some point. And from that perspective, I think it is interesting that it's a dragon, you know, George and the dragon, and it's coming up from the British Empire. Mm. But in terms of how it's treated, yeah, it's just kind of a war movie, but very much a post nine eleven war movie. I think. Yeah, I was surprised that the Americans weren't the solution to the problem. No, they kind of made it worse. <laughs> they come in with their tanks and their helicopters, and then everyone just dies. Yeah, kind of interesting coming after nine eleven because Americans are very patriotic, but in this movie, the Americans are kind of not that level headed. In their approach to defeating the dragons, and I, I'm not saying the Brits were either, because they were just hiding. Yeah, they didn't even want to defeat the dragons. No, and they laughed when Van Zandt said, "You know, I've slayed all these dragons," and they didn't think it was even possible. But yeah, it was interesting. I expected the Americans to come off better off. I guess. Yeah. No, I thought it was interesting that yeah, the the British were shown as being cowardly but resilient, and、mm. the Americans were shown as being brave but rash.、Yes. And it's really the combination of the two that ended up being successful. And I、mm. I like it.、Mm. But I have to say, there's no way that a whole bunch of tanks and <laughs> military vehicles can just wander around the countryside and not be destroyed by dragons. There's no well, way. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and a helicopter. Come on. Yeah, I think one of the most unrealistic things in this film is a, I think a helicopter requires a lot more maintenance than they make out. Mm. Like, where are they getting the fuel from? Yeah, <laughs> it's I know. It's just ridiculous. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> While the Brits are, you know, surviving on like bare minimum bullets with rifles and Morse code and horses. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. One thing that is very British about this film, to wrap us up, is the music by Edward Shearmer. Okay. Who I know principally as being a composer who works on sort of prestigious costume drama-y type of oh, productions. okay. Like The Wings of the Dove and The Count of Monte Cristo. But actually looking at his filmography, he's done quite a wide range of things. Huge range. I mean, it's so huge. Species 2, Cruel Intentions, The Sweetest Thing, Johnny English, The Skeleton Key... Then Bride Wars and Charlie's Angels Full Throttle and then Rain of Fire. That's quite a diverse amount of genres. It is, yeah. And even Diary of a Wimpy Kid movies. So he's quite versatile, much mm. more than I thought of. This movie, I think it's quite pleasingly analogue for the early 2000s when Hans Zimmer's Media Ventures machine was kind of taking over action scores. It's nice to hear something that's a classically trained composer composing for real instruments. Mm. There isn't a lot of production effects or synths and loops and things happening here. Some of it's a little bit antiquated, maybe, a little bit florid. Yeah. But it's quite unremittingly dark and themeless, so it kind of passes by without you really sort of noticing anything. Mm. It doesn't sort of linger long in the memory, but it's effective in place, I thought, yeah. most of the time. I think he summed it up perfectly. It's really nice to have a full orchestral score with some really interesting percussion. I think mm. it sounds like an anvil. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's I'm a not lot sure of is. metallic stuff in there. It's really cool. Yeah, which is quite appropriate with, you know, dragons and knights and yeah. that sort of thing, <laughs> castles. But yeah, like you said, it is a little bit expected. Hmm. It did feel like you were listening to an 80s score yeah. or like an early 90s score or something. It didn't sound modern orchestral. And it was good and it was effective, very stirring, some amazing brass themes in there and crazy string tremolos and all sorts of stuff. But yeah, nothing that really stood out. Like it did seem quite generic, even though it was really impressive. Yeah. It's not like it was cheesy or simple or basic or anything. It, it still was a very, very impressive score. But yeah, it just kind of flew over you and then the movie ended. <laughs> yeah. It didn't set my world on fire. How about no, that? No, it did it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but I, I mean, I still enjoyed it. And I'm glad that they didn't go down, like I said, the Matrix, Resident Evil, Underworld route, where it's just, you know, modernized electric guitars and drums and stuff like that. Like the trailer. I know. Don't watch a trailer. Awful. So I'm glad that they didn't do that. But at the same time, I'm not sure whether this really made the most of what it could have been. No, you're exactly right. Yeah, that trailer, maybe I must have seen that. And been put off the movie because... Oh, the trailer. So I didn't even know this thing existed, really. Yeah. Well, I kind of was aware that it existed, but I'd never really thought about it or seen anything. So I guess I must have seen the trailer and just thought, oh, God, this is not for me. Yeah. I think I was just put off by the late 90s slash early 2000s CGI just not being very good. Yeah. And I just thought, oh, this is a dragon movie. Surely it's all going to be CGI. It's going to be terrible. And I do remember watching Dragon Heart and not being that impressed. I can't even remember it. It's Sean Connery, isn't it? Sean yeah. Connery is the dragon. The voice, yeah. <laughs> Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Movie Awards. It's the Moobly Awards. It's where we bring to the table our favourite dragon roaring parts of the film in the number of mostly blackened charcoal categories. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Best quote. My favourite quote is from Van Zan, and I mentioned it in our discussion. It's when he's berating the British people for celebrating the felling of a dragon. He says, Envy the country that has heroes... Pity the country that needs them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bold claim. 
It is, yeah. So basically saying, yeah, stop celebrating because, you know, there's a bigger problem here. Mm, <laughs> Killing mm. one dragon and celebrating us is not going to solve this issue. Right, right. My favorite quote, it's right at the start of the movie, actually. It's when uh, one of the workmen in the uh, tunnels <laughs> is talking to Quinn as a boy. And, he's, and he says, uh, Quinn, and what brings you to the asshole of the world? In which Quinn replies... You're passing through it. What does it make you? <laughs> <laughs> Best hair or costume? Is it going to be the same person? Is it going to be possibly. Van Zandt? I <laughs> of mean, course. he is just stereotypical American, exactly how you would expect an American to show up in a tank with his, like, cut-off military vest and just look at the, even the American flag on his on, embroidered on his breast, and the tribal tattoos, and his you know his ripped muscles, and his shaved head, and chewing. I don't think he ever smokes that cigar, does he? He's just constantly no, just chewing so. it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's exactly how I'd imagine any American to show up uh, in yeah. the apocalypse. In a tank. Of course, yeah. <laughs> of course, yeah. I love the way he's wearing like a bomber jacket that he's ripped the sleeves off so you can see his tattooed yeah. guns. Yeah. You know. yeah. Got to have the gun show, haven't you? Mm. He's quite a specimen, it has to be said. Oh, he's considering he his previous film was a rom com, and yet here he is with a shaved head with his arms out, sort of yeah. on top of a tank. <laughs> Hello, ladies. Mm hmm. Conrad. What was your pick for costume? Uh, well, my favourite, you touched on it in our main discussion, is the children all clad in blue. Uh, and I yes. thought, my goodness, even in a post-dragon apocalypse, there are school uniforms. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you can never escape them. Yeah. I, the, they just all looked like they escaped from an orphanage, from, <laughs> from Annie's orphanage or something. <laughs> <laughs> Most naughty moment. For me, the most 2000s thing about this movie is, I think I mentioned it, is that it's very post 9-11 in terms of its imagery. It's a bunch of people wandering around in ash, mm -hmm. trying to deal with this monstrous adversary that they'd never expected. And I I just thought, mm, yeah, it's post 9-11. It's the early 2000s, for sure. Right. Um, War of the Worlds is probably the most obvious comparison, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't pick that. I didn't pick that. Uh, most 2000s part of this movie is, it is part of the resurgence of more sort of traditional fantasy films. Hmm. So Harry Potter came out in 2001. Lord of the Rings, the first one, 2001. Yeah. Aragon, 2006. Narnia, 2005. The Golden Compass, 2007. Yeah. Stardust, 2007. It's that sort of resurgence of you know, fantasy with, with magic and creatures and dragons. And it, yeah, it started in the 2000s, apart from Dragonheart, which seems to be an anomaly, which came out in 1996, <laughs> that no one seems to like anyway. So, yeah, I, and also, I didn't know Dragonheart has four sequels. Who's watching these sequels? Uh, how? <laughs> Surely know. Dennis Quaid isn't in them. I don't know, but I think they're all straight to DVD. Oh. But, yeah. Anyway, resurgence <laughs> of traditional fantasy. Yeah, very true. Favourite scene! I guess we will pick just one of the dragon scenes, right? Yeah. My favourite was probably the cheesiest, but I, I did actually quite enjoy it. So the first dragon takedown with uh, Van Zandt and his crew, the helicopter and... and Jumping out of the plane and somehow luring the dragon and then shooting those nets yep. and I mean, what are, what is the percentage of actual success with that? Because it just seems <laughs> wrought with flaws. <laughs> like it's it, it's a miracle they actually pulled that off, but uh, it's just a really yeah. really tense, suspenseful, action packed scene, and it does show. Christian Bale's character, Quinn, and, and his sort of resourcefulness and, and his, his bravery, really. That was my favourite too, because right. I was not expecting a skydiving action <laughs> sequence yeah. in a, a dragon movie. I just wasn't. Yeah. And 
I was blown away by it. I thought it yeah. was really exciting and tense, and it mm. wasn't what I was expecting. Most cliche fantasy moment. My fantasy cliche is Return of the Dragons, because I don't know if you've noticed this, but dragons never just sort of exist generally. I mean, they do in well, even in Harry Potter, he has to go out and find an egg. But it's they're always returning. So like in Game of Thrones, they're extinct, but then right. Dragon Lady brings them back, and or oh, there's one last dragon, and it's Sean Connery, or yeah, you know, it's always That's bringing true. back dragons. I think in Aragorn, sure it's like one last dragon as well, or something. Is it? Oh, I haven't oh, seen. I, that I haven't. I watched it a while ago, so I could be completely wrong. But I, <laughs> I do feel like there's a scarcity of dragons. It's not an abundance. Yeah. yeah. No, they're always a rare thing. That's a very good point. Mm. Uh, my cliche. It's it's more of a sci-fi action fantasy cliche i guess it's the macguffin or the thing that fixes everything the bomb the explosion the reactor <laughs> the one single dragon that they have to kill that just fixes everything and oh, it's yeah. very convenient and it's just like why did they not figure that out before <laughs> they've had like 20 years come on yeah i know it's ridiculous. And originally it was supposed to be one big female dragon and all of the other dragons were male uh -huh. drones. Then would so make it was like sense, a queen. I feel. It would, yeah. So why change it? I don't know. They yeah. changed it at the last minute and it doesn't really make any sense. Mm. Best special, special effect. effect. Obviously the dragon is the best special effect. It really is. But yeah. I would like to point out one scene in particular, and it's a practical effect, and it is the dead dragon. So the one yep. that Van Zandt Me spears. <laughs> I think this is also the, the same favorite special effect I pointed out for Dragon Slayer as well, the dead dragon. Yep. But looks so impressive in this movie, and it looked like it was about to come alive. Like I, I was, mm. I was staring at its eyes, thinking, "Oh, this thing's gonna have one last gasp of something, some movement." But it, it didn't. But it was very, very realistic to me. It's a beautiful piece of sculpture, is what it is. So it was created by a British prop and effects house called Artem. They're based in Middlesex, and they built a head, a body, and one 120 foot wing that was semi transparent enough to show the veins, the vein wow. work inside yeah, it, right. but strong enough to withstand the Irish winds. And then it was shipped up to Ireland and put in the quarry. And it wow. looks incredible. So good. Favourite sound effect. So my sound effect is the dragons again, and it's uh -huh. specifically the flyby sound that oh, it makes when yes. it ambushes Van Zandt. Is this yours too? Yes. Oh, I love yeah. that sound. It's, it's great. It's so interesting. It's not it what is, you expect. It is, yeah, because it's... No, it's not. And it's not electronic and it's not obviously from another animal. It's this weird sort of hang glider with holes in the wingspan sort of sound. It's sort of making that sort of air rushing noise i i don't know it's it's great i really really enjoyed it i thought it was yeah. really good because i mean there are other parts in the movie where you hear the dragon just doing the normal of the wings but that sound in particular has a very sort of meaty whizzy sound to it like almost like a giant yeah. fly like it was like sound ah oh, it was really really cool most funniest oh, moment there's one scene where when the guy, AJ, I think he's played by Alexander Siddig, he hears some radio chatter and he tries to warn the Falcon guy, Barlow, yep. apparently that's his name, um, requesting him <laughs> to take a look. And then the Falcon guy responds referring to his Falcon, a look at what? She's not moving. And then <laughs> AJ <laughs> retorts back saying, forget the bird. Use a scope, you wanker. <laughs> just such a great British line. <laughs> it is, yeah. I love hearing wanker in American movies yes. because I think they really enjoy hearing it every now and again, don't they? Mm. 
It's such a very British <laughs> word. And it's a weird thing to hear Alexander Siddig say as well, because he's he usually plays somebody who's very erudite. I don't know, maybe it's oh. just because of his doctor role on Deep Space Nine. But right. yeah, for him to come out with wanker is quite fun. <laughs> What was your favourite? Well, for me, the film is very well composed. There are some really nice shots in the movie. Um, the scene where Quinn is uh, putting up that um, last imaging thing that they need, and mm. it's beautifully composed, and there's a horse on the hilltop behind him, and it's framed by the sky. You know, There's some lovely shots in this movie, but sometimes they're a little bit staged, and when it's the children, they are not good enough at making it seem natural and styling it out. So there is a scene after the dragon has raised the castle to the ground and they're all emerging and blinking and looking at the wreckage of their castle, which coincidentally looks no worse than it did before it got burned, to right. be honest. Yeah. One kid walks up to some chains and starts sort of idly sort of swinging on them. And one kid comes into the foreground on one side of the picture and adopts a thousand mile stare. And they're both sort of beautifully composed in this shot. And I just burst into fits of laughter. It's like, no, no children behave like this. <laughs> and they're clearly looking for their marks. All of them, right. I can just see it. Oh. They're just looking for their marks. Okay. So I had to giggle. But Rob Bowman tried to make a good looking movie and I can't fault him for that. There are mm. a lot of nice shots in the movie. Yeah. And that's our Mooblies. Hey, this is Brian from TV Trivia Pod and you are listening to Movie Oubliette. Yes, it's their time. Final verdict. Should Rain of Fire be freed from its dark cave in the London underground to be known by all and set the world ablaze, or should it be shot with a Rambo explosive arrow and its dead remains tossed <laughs> into the Oubliette to be lost in Dragon's cinematic history? Oof. Conrad, first time watching... What's your final verdict? Well, I have to say, on the basis of the trailer, I <laughs> did not think I was in for a good time. <laughs> and with this lineup as well, you know, I, I expected a certain kind of movie, and up to a certain point, it was almost going to be that kind of movie, but then it surprised me. And certainly in its main male characters, it has to be said that there aren't really any other characters, mm. and particularly the women don't have anything to do. But the treatment of the two male characters' arcs is interesting and it takes some surprising turns. The effects cannot be faulted for the time period. If they wanted to set a new benchmark for dragons after Vermithrax in Dragon Slayer, I think they did it easily. Mm -hmm. I think it's fairly easy to say that they clearly influenced dragons in Harry Potter and in Game of Thrones that came after this. I can definitely see some influences there. And I I just was surprised I really enjoyed it. I wasn't hugely emotionally invested in it. It didn't capture me in that way, but I thought it was a really entertaining film and I was engaged right until the very end. So yeah, I think this one has been unfairly forgotten. I think it's it's an interesting movie and I'm glad our patrons brought it to our attention and voted it up. So mm. I would let it go. I would let mm. that dragon fly. How about you, Dan? Yeah, I mean, I think if you if you look at this movie under a microscope, there are, there are a lot of flaws, like a lot mm. of flaws. <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, living in the castle is just the most idiotic thing I could imagine. But you cannot disregard the creature designs of the dragons. They just looked amazing and even now they still yeah. look amazing for 2002 this is so impressive yeah i thought the characters of van Zan and quinn were a step above what you would expect from a movie like this mm -hmm. and the premise of of an apocalypse in the future being ravaged by dragons that is hugely intriguing for me and I yeah. was surprised. I really was surprised. I didn't expect that. I thought it was just going to be a stock standard medieval fantasy movie with knights and dragons, but it really wasn't. And so mm -hmm. I do commend them on that. And 
I think I would recommend this to most people, but it is very much a boys' movie. Oh, yeah. Uh, I don't know whether any female audiences in- would enjoy this movie, but yes, I, I would recommend this to-, to most people, I think, maybe. Yeah, I mean, there's a scene where McConaughey takes his shirt off, which would appeal yeah. to a lot of women, maybe, but, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> yeah. It is interesting to see Matthew McConaughey, Christian Bale, and Gerard Butler yeah. in such early roles, and them not really finding their place yet. Like it, it, it no. is kind of yeah, it's it's interesting. So yeah, watch it for that. Even yes, let's release it. Yeah, let's release it. Fly, my pretty fly. Yay, Holly, <laughs> you fall. Well, that was great fun. Yes, that was. Thank you to Matt. And uh, all the people that voted, uh, let's do this again soon. We should do. And if you would like to nominate and vote on films, then please do head on over to our Patreon, where for as little as a dollar you can do just that and get access to extended bits of episodes, including full exclusive versions of our interviews with people like our guest from the previous episode, Sandy King Carpenter. That's a good interview. It's an excellent interview, yeah. And for five dollars you can get access to our minisodes, where we review recent movies. Yes, and to keep up to date with our episodes, you can follow us on all our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as Movie Oubliette. And you can email us at movie.oubliette at gmail.com. We love to hear from you. Yes. Tell us how much you didn't or did enjoy Rain of Fire. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you were actually trying to punk us with this movie. Who knows? Yeah, maybe you all hated it. Uh, and if you'd <laughs> like to get hold of our merchandise, we have it all. Mm. It's all on Redbubble. Just search Movie Oubliette and you can get a nice mug or a tote bag or a T-shirt. Yeah, or a clock. We have a clock now. Oh, we've got clocks. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, yeah, I want one. I'm really jealous. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, So, Conrad, what are we going to be doing in the next episode? So next time, we will be enjoying a little bit of childhood nostalgia, Dan. Oh, haven't done one of these in a while. No, it's one of those ones where I subject you to a film that I saw as a kid. So (laughs) this is the 1988 British dark fantasy film... Paper House. Of course, it's another movie I've never heard of. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Starring Charlotte Burke, Ben Cross, Glenn Headley and Elliot Spears and directed by Bernard Rose, the director of the original Candyman. Oh, wow. That's a pretty iconic film. It is, yes. And we will be joined by the man himself in that episode. Oh, again, I don't know how you get these guests. <laughs> Me neither. I think it was possibly because I wrote to him and said, we'd love to talk to you about your first film, Paper House, and not Candyman. And he mm. was very excited to do so. Oh. So I'm really looking forward to that. Mm, me too. Well, until then, thanks everyone for listening. Goodbye. Bye. We review the films others tend to forget. Come with us and open up the movie you be yet. There's nothing magical about it. They're made of flesh and blood. You take out their heart and you bring down the beast. All right, all right, all right.